All right, let's take a look at a line that for a number of years, it gave me problems. The Trumpowski. Why did it give me problems? Not because it's overly good, it's just anything you face rarely. It has that inherent surprise value. And I hated seeing it because I'd much rather play, you know, main line of something. And you forget to study it, and you don't take it very seriously. Well, anytime I found out that my opponent was playing the Trumpowski, I would play 1g6 or 1d6 to just avoid it altogether. That's a good trick to be annoying in the modern-day preparation scope. But then, when I wrote my most recent book on Chessable, I had to do a line against the Trump, and... I wanted something simple yet effective, and the following game is going to show exactly how to put a structure into practice when facing the Trumpowski and the memory markers involved to give a preview of that Benoni course. So I go G6, and for Grunfeld, Kings Indian, Benoni, and Binko players, G6 is a good move here. And almost every Trump book, when I started studying the Trump for white, 15 years ago, it's like, this is just garbage. We can just double the pawns and we get exactly what we want. The ideal scenario with e3, g3, bishop g2, I'm gonna go c4, knight c3, knight e2, knight f4, and pile up on the d pawn or get queenside expansion. So it's like, okay, so you gave up the bishop and you're supposed to get this ideal structure. And there's Famous game between Adams and Kasparov that would be noted in all of these books from the 90s. It's like, all right, well, I guess it's good. Well, not really. Is after E3, the general theme that you have to know with black is never allow yourself to get an isolated pawn. So let's say, for instance, this is what we're trying to avoid. Now, why are we trying to avoid this? because of White's ideal plan. They're just going to pile up on our pawn. So say knight c3, g3, bishop e6, bishop g2, and White can literally pile everything onto the d-pawn. And when you've got a clear weakness, they've got a clear target, all their pieces are attacking, all your pieces are defensive, you got a garbage position. So the rule is, as soon as they go c4, you take. Get rid of the pawn. No double pawn. The next thing is, why this position was considered bad for so long is people were misplaying it. They were putting the bishop on this natural-looking square that has no future. Better squares on d6. Now we have our ideal structure. And as soon as they go knight e2, well, I'm going to go h5. If you don't do anything, I'm going to play h4, and I'm going to be able to utilize the open h-file to attack with. And if you go h4, you've now given the potential for me to sacrifice at some point on the king side, or to play for an all-out attack. So I just complete development, very solid. And we go c4. And what's our rule? All right, no isolated pawn, so I'm going to capture. Now, our main claim for the double pawns is our bishop pair. So the rest of this game is going to be how to get the most out of our bishop pair. So first we need to maintain it. And now the thing about this position and why I deem it as you can play this all day for black where is white's plan? You're supposed to go for a d5 or b5 break, but the more the position opens up, the more it's going to favor the bishops. And in this case, my opponent rushes and plays d5. So we have a couple of moments, and I want you to keep in mind that this is a three-minute game, but we're going to have some pauses and some points for calculation. And here's the first one. And I wanted to say I took a few seconds here and then came up with my plan for the next five moves or so because it's mostly forced. So first, I started with knight b6. 
say, okay, you've got a pair of knights, I've got a pair of bishops. If the queen gets traded, my rook's going to be on the open file. That's a benefit. And if you take here, at least my bishop's going to be anchored and improved. Do you want to trade queens? He says no. Okay, so what is the best way to handle this situation? Is in just getting back from nationals and analyzing, I don't know, roughly 100 games or so, I see with lower-rated players, they have this penchant for, it's like, monkey see, monkey do. Monkey see, check, monkey do, check. Monkey see, capture, monkey do, capture. Without any deeper thought to it. So let's dial it back here and go, if I capture, how is this bad for us? The knight gets a better square. Don't help your opponent improve their pieces. Well, if I move my bishop, I can lose my c8 bishop. I can lose the b7 pawn. And a lot of people would stop there and go, well, white's better because I can't, can't finish development. Oh, we've got the bishop here. Yes. Bishops are better in the open position. Yes. Activity is good in chess. Yes. We play the queen's gambit. We give a pawn for time. What's the difference doing it here? There isn't one bishop e6. Say, okay, he trades. Well, thank you. So I've got a great square for this bishop and an active rook on an open file. They take. Now, this is a second open file. And I had to realize that I had immediate compensation in this position after rook d2. And it's difficult to recommend a move for white. I saw the natural rook b1 and that bishop f5 doesn't work due to e4. But this does. Pressure, pressure. And my opponent had a knee-jerk reaction here. Hard to make too many recommendations. I take. Now, knight b5 hitting the a pawn. And this is where you f should feel the need to be critical. Because it's very easy for a position like this to get away from you and for it to be a draw. So for the rest of the game, I want you to constantly use the Kotov thinking process, which is comparing three moves, put an emphasis on the most aggressive move first, and compare. So some people are looking at immediate defense. The knight moved. It attacked our pawn. I need to defend the pawn. No, that should not be the first consideration. Your first consideration should be aggressive moves like taking on a2. So, so far we've got move the a pawn more than likely to a5, or take the pawn on a2 one way or another, or what I found to be a nettlesome and annoying move in the position, bishop c4. And after rook b1, we have another moment here. So if I take on b5, they simply take back on b4, and we've got dwindling winning chances. So a5, a3. And we got a little bit of calculation here, but from this point after... I don't know, a 10, 15 second think, I saw the rest of the game. So we do need to consider plans like if I capture and push, but then we run into bishop f1, and as this bishop gets out of the way, we may be pushing our pawn, but they can push theirs, and very likely we get a scenario like this, which ends in a draw. So if you want to win, you've got to avoid these mass liquidation scenarios. 
So coming back to a3, again, most aggressive moves. Capture is definitely something to look at. So checks, no checks to consider that are worthy. Captures and threats. So we looked at the main capture in the position, bishop takes b5. So now you should look at threats. And I wanted to make this idea with taking the knight work. And then I put together the previous line that I'd calculated and looked at bishop d3. Because this rook must stay tethered to attacking our dark square bishop. So it leaves it only one square on b3. Now when I capture, I'm getting a full tempo on the rook, and I gain extra time. So you're like, you were trying to avoid this scenario. Well, what's the difference on why I went for this, and now it's completely winning? So find the most forcing moves, and you'll find the win. Well, pushing the pawn will transpose back into the variation we looked at before. Rook b2, on the other hand, gets behind the opponent's passer. Says, would you like to trade? I'd be happy for you to trade, so I can just make a queen. So they go rook a1. Now, it's very easy to mess this up. If you go bishop takes and push, that's a big threat. But they'll just go king g2. And now we end up transposing back to the draw line. So after rook a1, what's best? a2. The white king's still in the back rank. Next, rook b1. And one way or another, we'll either be making a queen, winning the rook, or winning the bishop. So the opponent decides to go for this endgame. And now it's the next phase. What should we be looking at? What should we do? What's the technique to win this? Because this is a trivial in-game position. Some people would glance and be like, hmm, you know, I don't know, there's a little something here. Not really. I'm going to shuffle around for a bit to see if I can't optimize my position. I'm not in a hurry to just push pawns. But generally, the creation of a pass pawn is going to be what's ideal for us. So, as we shuffle a bit, the bishop attacks the f-pawn, so I defend, and I shuffled in a way which I wanted the opponent to anchor their bishop. Why? My worst pawn is my double pawn. I can get rid of it. So far, I feel like it's good technique, a little bit of trickery. Now, if I was playing this and I wasn't sure and knew the exact technique to win, I would be taking a lot of time per move in a game, especially if every time I moved, my opponent would go into a deep think or be thinking a lot in this position. I would take a lot of time and make them feel comfortable because there's only one clear plan here in my mind. And people are like, well, why don't you just play it? Well, good technique in end games is if you can do it in 10, 20, 30, 40 moves or do it immediately, you want to wear down the opponent. So you want to wait. That's good technique. And my pawns are on light squares. So I'm going to get them on dark squares. And after I played f6, g5... I'm either going to be able to capture, which will isolate the pawn, or I will be captured, which will then give me the opportunity later to create a pass pawn. So at this point, I know I can imbalance the pawn structure and create targets in the long term. It's just a matter of when. 
So a little bit of back and forth. I keep the rook on a dark square so there's no tricks. There's our first move. There's our second move. And again, we don't mind this capture because at some point I can push and create a pass pawn. The opponent's waiting around. I got what I wanted, an isolated pawn and target. Then the rest is quite easy. And to me, it's easier to win this king and pawn in game than to keep the pieces on the board. So a little bit of shuffling. And we optimize. And I have secured the path of the pawn to queen. And the opponent had had enough. So hopefully you enjoyed this line in the Trumpowski from the Benoni Simplified on Chessable and the end game as well as the thinking process and calculation. I've been working a lot with my students on this actual thinking process and take some from Kotov as well as other instructors. So credit where credit is due. But overall, if you're going to play good chess, you've got to be asking questions and being reflective to lead your thought process towards good moves. Overall, game with the bishop pair, punish the Trombowski.